All right, let's go to our sermon. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians 6, I'm going to read verses 10 through 20. And follow along as I read. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We'll stop right there. The Bible tells us that Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is both substance and evidence of things you can't prove by the senses alone. We're also told that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, by the scriptures. Romans 10, verse 17. There's no such thing as real Christian faith that's not based on the scriptures, that's not based on the Bible and what's written in the Bible. God didn't give us candles to light. He didn't give us incense to burn or a string of beads. He didn't give us images and statues to kneel before and put flowers in front of. He gave us a book. He gave us, but it's the only physical thing that the believer needs to touch, to hold, and to consult when he wants to hear from God. He gets his instruction, he gets his doctrine, he gets his promises from God through God's book. And he gets his uh, eternal hope through that book. A Christian's faith is tied to the Bible. It's tied to God's book. And so with those words in mind as an introduction, I call this sermon, Things We Do, by faith. Things we do by faith. And first of all, by faith, we stand. Here in the text, verse 14, it says, Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So pull up your pants and tighten your belt. This is serious business. If Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, then to stand in him will mean you believe anything the Bible says about him, and you believe any promise the Bible makes concerning him, because your faith is based on a book. It means to believe in your salvation and the cleansing of your soul, because the Bible says it so. Where's the amens, people? Come on. You're going to need to sit closer so the mic will pick you up? I appreciate that. But if you're standing in him, it means you believe you have passed from death unto life. Because the word of God says so. Christ said, He that believeth on me, or he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 5, verse 24. If you're standing in Jesus Christ, it, mean, it means that you believe that you are a new creature in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. By the way, all the modern translations say a new creation which is false. The new creation Jesus Christ introduced was a body of believers made up of Jews and Gentiles together called the church. Nothing like that had ever been thought of before. 
individual members of that creation are creatures. That's you and me. If you're standing in him, it means you believe that you are now seated in heavenly places in Christ. Because Ephesians 2 verse 6 says that you are. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein ye stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 5 verses 1 and 2. A Christian hopes to see the glory uh, of Jesus Christ, and he hopes for the glorification of his body, because the word of God promises those things will, be, will take place. You and I hope for those things. We stand on a book. We stand on a book. Not only do we stand uh, by faith in what God's word tells us, but we stand on it, on the word of God, more than the opinions of any other man, more than any church, more than any denomination, more than any authority in this world. The word of God is the highest authority that you and I have. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 23 and 24, the Apostle Paul writes, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. A minister or a pastor or a preacher, his word is not the final authority. He is given by God as a helper to the Christian, as a helper to the believer's faith, his walk in the Lord, his uh, knowledge of the word of God. And if he ever says something that is contrary to what's plainly written on the pages of the Bible, he's not a helper, he's a hindrance. He may even be a heretic. Right. Uh, but Paul also wrote 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. To stand by faith in Jesus Christ means you believe that the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you, credited to your account, and your sins were put on his death at Calvary. And a great transaction takes place between the sinner and the Savior, according to Romans chapter 4. And now there's no way to prove or demonstrate these things by the five physical senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. But uh, all of your hope, all of your confidence tells you that they're so. Tells you that they're so because the word of God states it. And your hope is put upon, is based on the truthfulness of that book. This is why having one Bible that you're convicted of is so important. You have 25 different translations. Which one's the word of God? Which one's not? What if they say things in different ways? Well, they can't all be right, can they? They might all be wrong, but they can't all be right. You stand on these things by faith, and no one can take it away from you. You have to be hard-headed about some things. That leads me to point number two. Not only by faith do we stand, but by faith we withstand. Verse 13 says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Let me tell you, the evil day is here. And in verse 11, he uses the word stand in the same context. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, to defend your position, not surrender any ground. To fend off the uh, barbarians at the gates. To fend off the accusations uh, made by non-believers, those who despise Jesus Christ, they despise Christians, they despise the gospel, they despise the word of God, they despise your standards, they despise your morals, they despise your convictions, and your, your um, uh, statement of faith in Jesus Christ in your home in heaven. They despise all of that. Not only defending yourself by the shield of faith, as he says, uh, above all, taking the shield of faith, but if possible, once in a while, it means to launch a counterattack by the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, if someone's not trying to argue with you, then by all means, don't start arguing with them. It makes them look calm and passive and you like a jerk. 
or as we say on the freeways, uh, you return fire, right? That's a Southern California joke for those of you watching on the internet. But the New Testament gives us two examples of the word withstand. Let me call those to your attention. First, in Acts chapter 13, if you want to turn over there, Acts chapter 13, and verses 7 to 10. Acts 13, verses 7 through 10. We're told about the deputy of the country, quote, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. He tried to run interference and tried to interrupt Paul's preaching. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes upon him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of God, etc.? You're a biblical pervert, is what Paul is telling him. Elymas tried to nullify Paul and Barnabas' testimony, and God allowed them to nullify him in the end. And he, and he allowed them to do so in front of anyone that was witnessing it. Paul wasn't going to let the guy get away with it. He pinned his ears back. Second example of the word withstand is found in 2 Timothy 3. And you don't need to turn. But Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. They're here. And then he describes the kind of loud, rude, obnoxious, belligerent, quarrelsome, argumentative, uh, disrespectful people that want to mock Jesus Christ and aren't interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They want to shut you down. They want to uh, run interference so that your preaching on the sidewalk can't be heard by people that need to hear it. People that drive by and honk their horns trying to drown out our young people on the street corner. I've been mooned on the sidewalk in the past. People throw cans of, you know, frozen fruit at you, cans of chili beans or whatever they got at the garage, just throw, the, throw it at you. Then you see that once in a while there's a car that drives around the block. You see that same car about 10 minutes later, and this time their window goes down about like that. Because they want to hear what you're saying. Sure. But he summarizes those kinds of people in verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. People know a lot of things, but they don't know God. That's true in the world today. And he, and he refers, he, as an example, he refers to the magicians in Egypt, there in verse 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also, the ones he's talking about, resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They have no reverence for the faith of Jesus Christ. That's the same faith that you're standing on, by the way. When they mock or suggest that Christians are bigoted, narrow-minded, intolerant to uh, troublemakers, and everything they're accusing you of, they're engaged in doing. But you're not supposed to get discouraged. You take solace in the knowledge that you're saved and they're on their way to hell. And remind yourself what they're trusting in to give them joy, to give them hope, give them comfort and peace. The things they're trusting in never do bring happiness. Yeah. 